what is this thing that we call happiness and what brings us happiness in the short and long term. In fact, we could probably point to happiness as one of the most sought after states or commodities or emotions, whatever you want to call it. Happiness is what many people are seeking in work, in relationships, and in general. And yet most of us can't really define exactly what happiness is or means for us. We can point to certain experiences. We can try and describe our states of mind and body, but most people recognize the feeling when we have it. And we certainly recognize the feeling of not being happy, whether or not that means simply not being happy as the absence of happiness or all out depression. Let's talk about happiness, this thing that everybody seems to want, and yet not everybody can agree upon what exactly it is or how to get it. So for instance, if I tell you I'm feeling pretty happy, I know what that means for me, at least in this moment, but you don't really know whether or not it means the same thing as what pretty happy means for you. If I say I'm extremely happy and I have a big grin, I have a grin on my face that I can't seem to wipe off my face, well, then you might get a sense of how much happier I am than pretty happy, but it's still hard to calibrate my level of internal state or happiness. And the same is true for you and for everybody else. It's been discussed many, many times that the total amount of income that an individual makes or has, and again, this could be income from work or it could be money that they inherited, does not seem to directly relate to their level of happiness. The amount of happiness does not scale with that income. That is for every additional $1,000 or $10,000 that they earn, they don't report being that much happier on a daily basis. Now, that said, I venture the argument that while money truly cannot buy happiness, it absolutely can buffer stress. And in particular, it can buffer stress in the form of the ability to purchase or pay for goods and services. Most of you have probably heard about the general conditions for obtaining happiness. And they always seem to circle back to some of the same basic features of get great sleep, have great social connection, pursue meaning, don't focus to any overextent on things like pursuing money, because there are indeed these studies that show that the amount of money that people makes does not necessarily scale directly with happiness. People's happiness does not necessarily scale with income. In fact, it tends not to past a certain level. And yet, I think we'd be remiss. I think actually it would be inappropriate for me to say that the amount of income that one makes is not important because if the amount of money that you happen to have or are making does not allow you to meet your basic needs of shelter, healthcare, et cetera, and or doesn't allow you to access the kind of social interactions that can renew and reset, or I would say directly enhance the kind of neurotransmitter systems and hormones that lead us to feel that we are happy in our life and we're having quality social connections. Money cannot buy happiness, but it certainly can buffer stress. And one of the ways that it buffers stress is by allowing options of different kinds of social interactions, options of different types of recreation that one can engage in to access new forms of social interaction and so on and so on. No one on their deathbed says they wish they had worked more. Well, indeed, the total amount of time that one spends working does not seem to determine one's happiness. There, we have to be careful with how we interpret these blanket statements that have become very popular that you know money doesn't determine happiness and that the amount that you work isn't going to determine happiness. It certainly is the case that if you earn more money from working more and that money is devoted to things that bring more opportunities for social connection or for buffering stress in other areas of your life, including healthcare, uh, care for your children, care for yourself, recreation, other things that you enjoy, well, then I think it's a little bit naive to assume that work itself is somehow counter to happiness, which of course it isn't. And it especially isn't if we combine that feature of work with another important feature of the human psyche, which is this notion of meaning, the big factors that determine happiness. It's going to be social connection, not income. It's going to be uh, the amount of time that you are able to have open thinking and creativity, which I think is an essential feature of happiness, by the way, physical health, in particular, one's ability to stay mobile 
and to be able to access the kind of daily activities that one needs to accomplish unassisted is a strong correlate of happiness and so on and so on where people in their 20s report being very very happy but as time goes on and they acquire more responsibility so typically getting married and having children in their mid to late 20s and 30s and into their 40s having more work demands etc happiness is tends to be rated lower and lower at least in those previous studies and then happiness tended to increase as people approach their 50s and 60s and they tended to retire and their work demands were shed from them and they were able to enjoy the small things of life despite the fact that in general i would say almost always people's health is not as vigorous when they're 70 as it is when they're when they're 20 there are exceptions to that of course but and of course you can adjust the rate of uh cognitive and physical decline but in general people in their 20s feel more physically and mentally vigorous than they do in their 60s and 70s in general Many of us have heard about meditation. Many of us think about meditation as a mindfulness exercise, mindfulness in quotes, because that itself needs definition, but as perceptual or focus-based training, which is really what the data point to. You know, uh, notions around consciousness and states of mind are very hard to define, but it's very clear that even a five minute a day or ideally an up to a 13 minute a day meditation can greatly increase our ability to focus. And for a wandering mind is an unhappy mind, also make it very clear that the ability to refocus again and again and again on what we're doing throughout our day, regardless of what we're doing, can have a very dramatic, in fact, a statistically significant increase on our levels of overall happiness. Social connection can and should come in various forms. And when I say various forms, I mean forms of brief interaction, more superficial interaction, and forms of deeper interaction. All of those are relevant to our states of happiness. And there's research to support that daily interactions with somebody at a cafe or just a brief hello or a smile, provided that we are both present or we make the effort to be present to those interactions, however brief they are, can have a positive effect on people's overall well-being, and not just in that moment, but consistently people are willing to explore certain topics with you. You're willing to hear them and listen really carefully for what they're saying. And they're willing to hear and listen to what you're saying in an attempt to understand. That certainly can enhance the sense of social connection leading to what people would call social bonds leading to increased happiness. If you want to increase happiness, you need to have quality social connections. And if you want to have quality social connections, you need to be present and engage in those social connections. And that requires a viewing of each other's faces, ideally, which is not to say that a phone call or text exchange can't be meaningful, but that faces are really the most powerful way to engage in social contact and that eye contact, not consistent eye contact, but eye contact of the sort that builds up and then breaks and builds up and breaks across the interaction is going to be the best way that we are aware of to feel that one had a real connection that focusing on the choices we've made and really investing in those choices as good ones or great ones and really trying to limit our thinking to the choices that we've made once we've made them is perhaps also important to our natural happiness because it's so inextricably entwined with what we think of as a good life. And what I mean by that is if we are constantly in a mode of evaluative decision-making even after we've made a decision, we are not neurochemically nor psychologically able to extract the feelings of happiness associated with the choice that we made. Working on being focused on whatever activities you happen to be engaged in, positive or negative, is known to increase your levels of happiness. Again, focusing on the choice that you've made and making the best of that choice, especially since you made that choice in a way that you deemed best at the time, well, that also is known to increase your overall levels of happiness. 